Well, good morning, everyone. I'm just going to turn on my video there so that people can see me. So again, good morning, everyone. Hello. My name is Rick Yad. I'm a professor and dean in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems here at Vancouver uh, of the UBC campus. Let me start off by saying that I hope you and your friends and family are safe and well during these challenging times. I want to um, say to everyone, I hope you're coping uh, because it is challenging right now. And so thank you for do joining us today. It's my pleasure today though to be the MC and to welcome everyone to this special UBC Connects Masterclass with Dr. Vandana Shiva. So before we start the program, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. And I'd like to acknowledge that the UBC campuses at Point Grey, Robson Square, and the Okanagan are situated on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, and in the territory of the Say-LK's Okanagan Nation. I would like to also acknowledge that some of you are joining us from many places near and far, and to acknowledge that the traditional land owners and caretakers of those lands that you are situated. So before I ask uh, our IT people to bring greetings from our president and vice chancellor, I'll just like to give you a bit of context with the UBC Connect series. UBC Connects is a public lecture series that features esteemed thought leaders and focuses on pressing global issues. Throughout the year, our campus holds panel discussions, inviting professors, students, and speakers from uh, the public sphere. I would like to also point out that statements issued by our panel speakers are not the views of the University of British Columbia. Our Senate a statement on academic freedom gives our faculty, staff, and students, as well as those invited to speak, the right to express their views in the pursuit of knowledge and instruction. So with that, I'll ask our IT people to bring greetings from our president and vice chancellor at the University of British Columbia, Santa Ono. Thank you, Ricky. And thank you as well to the land and food systems students who are participating in today's master class. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's virtual UBC Connects master class with Dr. Vandana Shiva on the future of food and farming in a pandemic world. I'd like to send a special thank you to our friends at the Indian Summer Festival for hosting such a wonderful talk with Dr. Shiva in May. We're thrilled to continue the conversation today. Dr. Vandana Shiva is an Indian scholar and environmental activist dedicated to protecting biodiversity. Her work looks at how people can produce more food, reduce hunger, cultivate better health, and reduce disease and poverty through conservation of biodiversity. She has been recognized for her contributions in the fields of women and the environment, biotechnology and intellectual property rights, and ecological issues related to agriculture. Dr. Shiva is one of the leaders and board members of the International Forum on Globalization and a figure in the global solidarity movement, which she refers to as the Earth Democracy Movement. Dr. Shiva once said, quote, what we owe each other is a celebration of life and to replace fear and hopelessness with fearlessness and joy, close quote. Words to ponder during these unprecedented times. All the best for today's masterclass. Thank you, Santa, for those wonderful words. And again, thank you, Dr. Shiva, for joining us. You know, when we were talking to the organizers, I was amazed at the number of people who are joining us today. It's close, close to 900, which is amazing. Today's masterclass is being recorded, and we will have a recording of the UBC Connects on the UBC Connects webpage shortly after the event. 
over the next hour, myself and the students from our faculty will have the opportunity to participate in a discussion with Dr. Shiva around the future of food and farming in a pandemic world. Dr. Shiva, thank you so very much for taking time to be with us today. We are so grateful for this opportunity. Dr. Shiva, as Dr. Ono has indicated, you bring a wealth of global experience to this topic. From the many books you've written on the importance of biodiversity to our food system and to our health, your education and founding of the Earth University in India has been inspirational. Earth University is dedicated to providing education to sustainable living and Earth citizenship. You are known as an agent of change. So with this, it's my pleasure now to introduce our student participants uh, who will be actually moderating and asking questions of Dr. Shiva. Let me first start off with our moderator, Amy Norgard, who is a Master's of Science student in soil science. Alison Gakhad is a fourth year student in our Global, Resist, uh, Global Resource System program. Bruno Texera is a Bachelor of Science student in the Food, Nutrition and Health, who's in his fourth year. Kara Legault is a student in our Applied Biology program, also in her fourth year. And then finally, Lenny Chung, who is a PhD student in food science. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amy. So Amy, over to you. And oh, we'll talk to, sorry, I jumped the gun here. So it's over to Dr. Shiva. My apologies. My greetings from India, from Dune Valley, from the valley of my birth, to all of you who joined this masterclass. Um, I love the opening video. And then it said, you have the potential. Now, my PhD thesis was actually from Canada, from the University of Western Ontario, from an amazing program called the Colloquium on Quantum Theory an interdisciplinary degree which brought together philosophers and logicians and physicists and mathematics. And I worked on non-separability and non-locality in quantum theory. So potential and non-separation is the training of my doctoral work. And uh, the, I do have an association with the University of British Columbia. I'm an honorary alum. I got an honorary doctorate from that beautiful campus. So I'm happy to join you all. Um, we are in the midst of a pandemic and we don't even know when it'll end, but it is so related to the issue of food and farming. It's related to the last half century of how the food production system has shifted and how the trade in food has shifted. We are literally being linked worldwide through the spread of disease as this particular COVID-19 pandemic. When we invade the homes of other species, manipulate plants and animals for commercial profits and greed and spread monocultures. New diseases are being created because a globalized, industrialized, inefficient food and agriculture model is invading into the ecological habitat, violating limits of ecosystems and the integrity of species. Corona, Ebola, Zika, MERS, the list is huge, 300, just in the last 30 years. We've created a disease-creating food system. And not only are these 300 new infectious diseases causing harm, they're added to the chronic diseases that are the comorbidity factors, diabetes, obesity, cancer, the rates of mortality shoot up from 1% to 9.2%. How did we get here? Why did we have to start invading the Amazon and the rainforests of uh, Indonesia to grow GMO soil? 
And one would think that this is related to feeding the world. Well, no one should be hungry if so much expansion of soya and palm oil was going to solve the hunger problem, a billion people are hungry, 250 million are being added with the lockdown. According to the World Food Programme, every day 300,000 will die if we don't make corrections in our economic system, our food system, and uh, how we grow our food and how we trade it. Is the GMO soya invading the Amazon, giving us food? No, only 10% of the GM soya and corn of the world goes into the human food system directly. 90% is biofuel and animal feed. And more and more biofuel will not solve hunger. In fact, my book, Soil Not Oil, shows it won't even solve the climate problem. 80% of the food we eat comes from small farms. This is FAO data that use only 25% of the land. Farming is care for the land. It's love for the land. It's not an activity to extract from the land. And that is why the Australian Aboriginal people who are called Bushmen were actually farmers for 60,000 years. In Asia, India, China, we've been farmers for 40 centuries. Even the Amazon was not forest people, they were gardeners. All the new archeological evidence is bringing this out. And no one had to invade. We could take care of the same piece of land. I have visited the spice gardens of the Western Ghats. Generation on generation on generation of spice growers have grown spice, spices in the same patch of land. Where did this invasive system, expanding system come from? came from the colonial spirit of invasion, conquest, grabbing other people's land. As uh, Cecil Rhodes said so clearly, you know, he founded Rhodesia. We must find new lands from which we can easily obtain raw materials and at the same time exploit the cheap slave labor that is available from the natives of the colonies. The colonies should also provide a dumping ground for the surplus goods we produce. This economy is what's causing the pandemic. And we have to make a shift in this. It's not just causing the health problem, it's causing the climate emergency. I mentioned my book, Soil Not Oil, the extinction embers, uh, um, uh, crisis, uh, the intergovernmental plan on biodiversity has shown if we don't change the way we do agriculture, <coughs> we'll be extinct. 200 Species are driven to extinction every day. A million are threatened. The two questions that keep coming up repeatedly, because this has been the narrative that has gone hand in hand. Now, I'm not trained in agriculture. That's not really my background. As I mentioned, my training is physics and my PhD is foundations of quantum theory. But I had to look at agriculture when in 1984, Punjab, the land where I'd done my MSc honors in physics, it was a peaceful state in the 70s. By 84, it was exploding in violence. 30,000 people had been killed. And a very, very important connection was there between Canada and this problem. A plane called Kanishka was brought up in that whole period. That same year, Bhopal, the disaster took place. And I offered to the United Nations University for whom I was doing a program, I want to look at this. My book, Violence of the Green Revolution, was written in that period. Two very dominant myths. And so much of my work in our text has been to study the truth of how do we do farming? How do you do good farming? And what are the costs of bad farming? So one is the myth that it's producing more food. It's not. It's producing more commodities. And as I said, those commodities go for biofuel and animal feed, not for feeding people. Uh, the measure of productivity is so wrong. The only inputs counted are land and labor, as if they're inert dead inputs, when they are the only two creative forces 
in an ecological process of producing food because growing food is a biological ecological process. And then the metric of yield per acre, my whole book, Green Violence of the Green Revolution, written in the 80s, shows it's a mismeasure. If you shift to biodiversity analysis, we grow more food with biodiversity. Indigenous people did it. People in North America weren't just roaming the prairies, they were gardening. Three sisters, wild plants. I've had beautiful dinners with indigenous people. Hundreds of plants served. So yield per acre, pseudo productivity, 10 units of inputs used to produce one unit of food. That is pseudo efficiency. Ecological agriculture uses one unit of input to produce 10 units of good food, not just for human beings, for our animals, for the butterflies, for the earthworms. And then is the issue of cost. Again and again and again, I'm asked, oh, but organic is too costly. Organic is for the elite. Therefore, we must have junk food that gives us diabetes and obesity. It's the only affordable thing. Well, the cost of food is as manipulated as the yield and productivity analysis. I've done a book for which our agriculture minister wrote the foreword, where did we did two cost accounting. And when you add the three factors that are always left out of the price, that actually made high cost production look cheap, we realized that actually industrial globalized food is too costly for the earth to afford, it's too costly for societies to afford. The three big deceptions that go in are subsidies. Look at $700 billion of subsidies go into distorting the prices in the global food system. Monopsonies, the monopoly in buying. My analysis has shown once the Walmarts and the supermarkets come in, a farmer gets 1% over what the consumer price. No, one, no wonder Walmart can say always cheap prices because they're cheating the farmer. And third is externalities. Externalities to environmental damage, to our health damage. If you look at the costs of diabetes, cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, it's a system we can't afford. We have a better way to move forward. A way where we take care of the health of the planet, our own health, we regenerate the soil, we regenerate biodiversity, we regenerate our health, we regenerate democracy, we generate what I call living economies. That's what I've been doing for the last 35 years. And I know it's totally doable. The world can have enough food while we protect the planet, while we conserve biodiversity. We don't have to invade in the Amazon. Every backyard can be a garden and we can stay home. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shiva, for those inspiring words. And now I'm going to turn it over to our very wonderful students. So Amy, uh, I'll turn it over to you to actually start the questioning period. Awesome. Thanks, Ricky. <clears throat> and thanks, Dr. Shiva, for that um, awesome opening this morning. Um, it really feels special to be here in conversation with you. Um, I've been working in the realm of food systems in various capacities for about seven or eight years, but it would have been almost 10 years ago that I was first in, um, in the documentary called Dirt. Um, and your conviction in that movie um, was so evident and obviously still hasn't, uh, hasn't gone away 10 years later. Um, of course, now the soil scientist in me, um, deeply offended by the title of that documentary, Dirt, um, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, so I guess uh, getting started this morning, um, starting off on maybe a more personal note, given that our conversation this morning will be more at a systems level. Um, I'm curious, uh, given that COVID has created uh, just so many changes for us, um, I'm curious what positive changes you've had in your life and maybe something that you'll carry with you um, after the pandemic passes. And also I'm curious where you're calling us uh, from this morning. <laughs> well, it's night for me and I'm calling you from my childhood home. I'd return here for home quarantine because I had to cut back my tour, lecture tour in Europe and I had to be in home quarantine. And then in the middle, they announced a lockdown, which is carrying on still. Um, 
So I am enjoying real mangoes that my mother planted. They're delicious. All the breeding that's been done has taken mangoness out of mango. You get pukey, yellow mangoes that have no taste, no flavor. We've got eight mango trees in the, my mother's garden. Each has a different flavor. Sounds so lovely. And um, I'm sitting in what was my mother's cow shed. And I was hesitating about that, Ken, you know. I said, I've saved the whole valley. I've saved so much by doing work and vacation. I want to do this work. And academics doesn't let me. So my mother said, chuck your job, come home, take the cow shed, turn it into your institution. So the research foundation for science, technology, and ecology was born in this cow shed. So I've come back home. I'm surrounded by trees my mother planted, the bees and the butterflies. Peace, total peace. So what's changed for me is my travel. Um, but then with these interactions, I'm probably interacting even more with wonderful young people like you. Awesome, that sounds really great. Some really nice changes. Um, I also love all of the stories of people ending up back at their parents' um, houses. And I think that actually has been um, quite an exceptional opportunity for a lot of families. Um, so diving right into our conversation then this morning, I don't wanna take up any more floor space um, and I'll actually uh, the virtual microphone over to my fellow uh, panelist, Kara. Hello, good morning. Your speech was so inspirational, Dr. Shiva. And uh, give me, yeah, everything you said, I just resonated with it so much. Um, so I guess my first question kind of following on some of the things you said, um, as we've been learning for such a long time, it seems like, and as we've really been shown during the COVID crisis, um, there are so many problems in our food system, um, the way we grow food, the way we distribute food. Um, so I guess my question for you is, what do you think the priority is, should be, or what is your greatest priority um, coming out of this crisis um, that we should be focusing on or that you want to focus on um, in changing the food system? And I guess, how do you plan to go about that? Or what do you think your focus will be coming out of the, the pandemic? Well, two things, you know, uh, what I've learned about food is that the web, food web is the web of life. Now in a web, you never say which point is important. In a web, every point is important. All relationships are important. And so for anyone who wants to work on this issue, just be the strand and weave the web and strengthen it and heal wherever it's broken. Whatever I will do now is connected to what I've done in the last 35 years. I mean, I, literally, I have had to work on agriculture by default to address the violence and create a nonviolent paradigm. Uh, but like I said, we've saved seeds, we grow more food in Navdanya, we offer a course. But I think the two big challenges we face is there's a rush to push industrialization of agriculture to the next level. And this next level is talking about farming without farmers, digital agriculture, removing everyone from the land. But ecologically, that's not going to work because you need people to take care of the land. You can spray Roundup a little more efficiently with the drone. But to be able to give back the gratitude to Mother Earth and re-establish our Earth citizenship is what humans are called to do and must do. The second big challenge is, I talked about how the pandemic and the chronic diseases that are amplifying the crisis are related to an industrial food system with fake ingredients. And now those who made big money in the 20 years, 25 years of deregulated commerce called free trade, WTO, paid no taxes, became the billionaires. The tech billionaires want to be drivers of the food system. And they want to be drivers of a fake food system. So then why should, we should have farms for food. We should have farms for raw material that will be constituted in labs. And just like we made a mess with biofuels, where we created refineries of biofuels with a very negative energy efficiency, 
we will create a negative amplification of an inefficient food system, but worse, we will create more disease because what I've learned, and you know, the, everything I've learned is by doing and seeking. I've learned nothing by rote, nothing. I've learned now that the biodiversity in the world outside matches the biodiversity in our gut. And disease is the assault on the biodiversity outside and the uh, gut microbiome. Now, every time you try and cheat on food, something in the gut microbiome says, sorry, that was cheating, and there's one new chronic disease. So I say, before you run to see how with 14 patents you can have an impossible burger, why don't you pause and look at what we've learned in the last, like I said, it's a 50 year mistake, fossil fuel, poison, chemicals, 30 years of learning its impact. Look at what humanity has learned about agroecology, biodiversity, health, and don't rush into the next extractive profiteering, killing the planet, killing farmers, and killing our health. So what I'm hearing is not necessarily going backwards, but progressing in a way that does consider the past, everything we've learned, everything we've done right and wrong. And I really love that. Um, part of what you said about incorporating people, keeping people incorporated in the farming um, leads me to one of the other questions that I had, um, because earlier you did mention that farmers, when food ends up in Walmart or in a superstore, um, farmers only get 1%. Um, so that value of people and of farmers has kind of been lost. Um, and I think alongside the COVID crisis, we've been seeing major social outcries and communities coming together um, to demand equality and reconciliation for indigenous and um, racial issues that have happened for centuries. Um, so I was wondering um, if you had any ideas or perspectives or opinions on how as a young farmer or a graduate or someone kind of entering the food system, um, what's the best way to incorporate reconciliation or promote equality in the work that we do, um, considering that we need to bring people back to the center of food production? Um, kind of, do you have any recommendations going forward with how to keep that as part of the core value? Two quick things, um, Amy. You know, I think this whole issue of a linear trajectory um, has, of the mechanical mind has so destroyed our way of thinking. Even in atomic physics, we know the atom has a nucleus and it has an electron going around. The electron is moving, but if it was not in the stationary state, it would collapse into the nucleus. So movement, dynamics, evolution, and being stationary in terms of stability, sustainability, you know, we've, we've treated sustainability as staticness and disruption and destruction as the power of creation. Totally misplaced. You know, this is the reason I've done so many books on ecofeminism, my book, Staying Alive which by the way was written right in this office in the days of manual typewriters i've seen the generation manual typewriters electric typewriters computers quite fascinating in these short 40 years how much change has happened in terms of the issue of young people we are facing three emergencies the a pandemic and the health emergency, the planetary health emergency, including extinction, including climate change. And we are facing, I would call it a work emergency. I don't use the word employment or I don't use the word jobs because these are vocabulary of an industrial system. Find me an indigenous person who uses those words. Uh, the same industrial agriculture model that worked on a pseudo efficiency where Productivity was defined by getting rid of people and replacing them with energy slaves. That system had to make it look like farming was a primitive activity. And that same narrative is carrying on. Farming without farmers is human progress. But if we think of where did the lasting societies, the permanent societies place farming, 
as the highest vocation. Even my civilization says there is no vocation that high, higher than farming and trade and commerce was the lowest. So taking care of the land is the highest vocation and it's a switch in our brain. You know, it's a cultural act. Like you're talking about inequality and racism. Uh, is there white superiority built into essentialism of whiteness and maleness? No, it's a construct, very violent construct. So how do we bring equality and dignity back into the farming system by first realizing we are all earth citizens, therefore all equal, different but equal, like the microbe and the mammoth are different, but they're equal in terms of their right to live. Secondly, not treating work in that very deceitful way as something you exploit and extract from, that labor is something you extract from. Rather, that work is the gift through which we become one with the earth. I spend a lot of time thinking about this. Everything else we get from the earth, everything else. Only in growing food can we give back a little portion of her, what she gives, a seed. She'll give us a thousand seeds, some of which we can eat. Little bit of the organic matter, she'll give us food forever. It is an amazing system where all we have to do is be grateful and the generosity continues. So it's these cultural shifts. And my book, Oneness Versus 1% One is finally coming out in North America in August. And uh, it is tracing a lot of this construct. It's, the subtitle is Shattering Illusions, Seeding Freedom. I love that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everything you just said. And I, um, yeah, I think I'll pass it forward to the next question. Yeah, thanks, Kara. Um, yes, yeah, so let's pass the mic over to Allison. Dr. Shiva, thank you so much. Um, I've been watching probably your speeches on YouTube for the past 10 years, and it's, I will admit it's a little bit disheartening to hear that we're still referencing the same statistics of 1% of wealth controlling the planet and, and things like GMO soya, 90% of it being made for biofuels and 10% being made for human consumption. And it really makes me wonder, you know, what what is the how do we change these statistics and how do we change the trajectory that's led us to, you know, this pandemic and where we are today? Um, and you, you mentioned how a lot of the technology and a lot of things like digital agriculture are being driven by the 1%. And I'm wondering if you see a place for technology to enhance nature-based solutions to enhance agroecology and to support smallholder farmers rather than displace them. Well, you know, like I said, I've lived through a period where there was a manual typewriter. It was seen as a technology which you used and chose, a computer. Each of these are technologies. And we should be choosing them. And we should be evolving them according to how much do they serve the earth and human well-being. It's only in the last 20 years that the vocabulary of technology has shifted from being about instruments and tools to being a religion, literally, a master. And, and instead of saying technology to do what, with what impact, we just say technology, you gotta have technology. Well, when I grow biodiversity of crops on my field, that's a technology of biological control. It's not violent, but it's still a tool. And I can spray pesticides. Interestingly, when I grow biodiversity, I'm actually more effective in controlling pests. There are no pests in our farm at Navdanya. And when I spray poisons, I have more and more pests. And when I do GMO BT cotton, I have more super pests. So I think, as I've written in my book, Oneness Versus One Percent, colonialism was about a civilizing mission. Indigenous people of Canada, anywhere in the world know how we were brutalized, we were violated, indigenous people of North America were exterminated for a civilizing mission. The civilizing mission then was colonialism and the religion, conversion. The civilizing mission today, I hear the rhetoric, 
And I said, my God, this is a new civilizing mission. Things that should be chosen should be chosen democratically. Things that should be evaluated should be evaluated democratically. The minute you take what humans have made, some humans have made, and turn it into the religion for everyone to adopt, technology has lost its toolness. It's become an instrument of mastery. And so I think, stop using the term technology in abstract. You know, let's start always being concrete, saying it's a technology to do this and it has this impact. And we should never introduce technologies without assessing impacts. That's why we had environmental impact assessment. That's why we had technology impact assessments. And these are being, this is part of what deregulation is doing just now. So we shouldn't talk of money and technology as absolutes and ends. We should talk of money and technology as means for higher ends. And for me, the higher ends are taking care of the earth and following the laws of Gaia and taking care of the well-being and the good for all. We can achieve that. Yes, that's fine. Bring whatever. But whichever tool undermines the earth's ecosystems and whichever tool takes power away and livelihoods away from people, I think we have to have a democratic discussion in society. Uh, take, you know, I, when I did my book on the Green Revolution, I went to the elders, the wise people in India. I said, you guys were the brilliant people of this country. Why didn't you have a debate at that time in the 60s? And they said it was introduced in the name of technology. And we were brought up as the generation which, which was told, you don't ask questions of technology. I said, well, that's like fundamental, fundamentalist religion. You're not supposed to ask questions of fundamentalist religion. Yeah? Uh, otherwise, you're a heretic. So technology, you're supposed to debate and assess. Um, and we, you know, we are literally at, in a period where the new civilizing mission is hit you on the, I've lived through my country being forced to adopt digital payments and made cash illegal in the middle of the night in 2016. 90% of the economy of people disappeared. Savings of a poor woman selling vegetables on the street went. So I really feel there has to be assessment, accountability, democratic choice. I love that concept of democracy and democratic choice that you bring up because I feel like the violence of the green revolution and everything we've seen is because we've lost that democracy and because research and development has been driven by large multinational corporations who are interested in solely industrial agriculture. And I'm, I'm wondering how we can better democratize science and research and development to not only serve the interests of large multinational corporate agriculture, but perhaps other interests of yeah, nature-based solutions and, and protecting our planet and conserving our planet while also feeding the world. So I, when I talked about my book on the violence of the green revolution, um, I did a lot of research. Where did these chemicals come from that killed people in Bhopal, got people farmers into debt in Punjab? And I realized that actually they all came from Hitler's labs, IG Farben. IG Farben and Standard Oil jointly, fossil fuels and finance from Standard Oil and uh, new chemicals, Zion B. Ammunition, the, the process for making ammunition by burning fossil fuels at high temperature is the same process that makes synthetic fertilizers, the same factories make it. So whether it's fertilizers or pesticides, the ancestry is in Hitler's concentration camps. Who were the companies that kept pushing it to make it inputs into agriculture and changed our agriculture thinking through all kinds of pressures, including, I notice you're from Philippines originally, Alison, yes? Uh, you know, ERI, the International Rice Research Institute, the CGIR system, the Green Revolution in Rice, that center had a very, very big role. So what we have seen in these last few years is, um, you know, I realize when you have too many names for the same phenomena as a scientist, I say one name, yeah? So I say this chemical, that chemical, this pesticide, that pesticide, 
and my friends keep looking into the individual details of the Roundup and the dicamba and all. And I've just decided I'm going to call the companies that make them, which were the IG Farben, I'll call them the poison cartel. So how do we make them accountable? I held a tribunal on Monsanto. That is how you democratize. We organized people's assemblies, brought together. It was all fragmented and the globalized system has been fascinating to watch. You know, we were national countries in a UN system and then globalization changed it. We became national politically, the economy became global, the players of the economy were global and we were stuck in our national systems, each with our current amazing leaders. What, how do we deal with this? People, you know, I used to go to Argentina, seeing the birth defects and cancers. I'd go to Brazil. I'd go to Canada, Percy Smyser, Sri Lanka, kidney failure. I said, we're going to bring all these cases together in one place. Say, here are all the crimes against nature and humanity. The following year, Monsanto was bought out by Bayer. So we have to mobilize in creative ways to bring accountability, especially where the formal system is being deregulated and dismantled. The second is we have to build alternatives. All of the work on agroecology has grown outside university systems, you know, but now universities are adopting them. Now the FAO talks about agroecology. The amazing science is emerging about the soil food web, about the insect web of life. I, I am absolutely excited about the future of science related to regenerating the earth rather than a science for killing life on earth. Because those are the two sciences we can choose from. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. I think as a student, I'm inherently excited as well as I hope everybody else is on this panel. I'll pass it back to Amy for the next set of questions. Awesome. Thanks, Alison. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to pass it on to Lenny, although um, just hearing everything from Dr. Shiva, of course, I want to ask a million follow-up questions, um, but I'd like to give Lenny and Bruno some time. So um, I'll pass the mic right over to Lenny. Thank you, Amy. And yes, I've also been mesmerized by this talk so far. So I guess following from the conversation, so you are optimistic. I guess if you had the greatest scientists and engineers, developers, makers, what research questions would you, what should we be asking? What, what should we be driving science and scientific discovery towards? Uh, just to touch on your last point. So Lenny, you know, I, I trained before I came to Canada, I was training in the in Indian Atomic Com Energy Commission in the fast breeder reactor. My head was up there. I too thought I knew more. Then I started to volunteer with the Chipko movement where I realized I learned nothing about it biodiversity. It's the women who've never been to school who are my teachers. So the first thing we have to learn is give up the white superiority syndrome of experts who know and others are fools. Everyone knows. Indigenous people are brilliant scientists. We've got to start respecting their knowledge of science. So the question I would pose to any kind of scientist from any discipline is, how do we grow food in ways that leaves the soil richer, the farmer better off, and the eater healthier? Simple question, multiple complex interactions, not a magic bullet solution. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for that. Let's pass it um, right over to Bruno. Yeah, thanks, Amy. And thank you, Dr. Shiva, for your thoughtful words about sort of the world that we're living in and, and how we can improve as a society moving forward. Uh, my question basically is in a hypothetical world uh, without large scale agricultural technology, how can you or we guarantee that benefits to local farmers would translate into food availability, uh, food affordability and food safety? Uh, for consumers both in their respective markets and society as a whole, especially in urban areas, concrete jungles such as Toronto, New York City, uh, that we find all over the world. Uh, 
So first, the concrete jungles have been created because the World Bank had decided that we don't need farmers. Everyone should be in the city because you, you can do more business in a city. And it was by conscious choice. People were driven off the land and cities became mega cities. I have watched in the pandemic how people who had left the villages because of the lockdown had to go back to the villages. Cities started to empty out. And I was in uh, Brazil during the Earth Summit. And the sit, you know, the Brazilians had been removed from the land. Kids were caught and thrown out. And we came back, my son was with me. And he says, Mama, why is it that our people can be free? And in Brazil, they capture children. And I had to explain to him how by choice, we had kept small farms, created laws on making land distributed, had ensured that farmers got a decent return. Very complex set of systems and it worked. So 75% of India stayed on the land. Only recently some left, but they're all going back. My basic vision is, why should we destroy the planet and the quality of our food by using energy slaves when more and more people want to take care of the earth. And with small farms, you know, when you talk small farms, it's like a garden. When you talk giant farms, it's like a war. We have to move from a war model of agriculture to a garden model of agriculture. When you ask me, how will you ensure enoughness, affordability, quality? Well, quality is guaranteed when you're consuming what is produced locally. You know the farmer who grew it for you. And I've just started a program in India called Swarast. We know. Swarast means both we have the confidence, but it also means health. And we launched it uh, this year precisely to address this question. Do we need third party certifiers who take 10 times more than the, what the value of the producers? No, you need community. So local community. Price wise, like I said, the extractive economy leaves 1% for the farmer. And a speculative economy makes food prices go up. We shorten the distances between the eater and the consumer and something that has happened during the lockdown, more and more CSAs were created, more and more local markets were created. The price becomes honest rather than that deceitful price. And third on enoughness, as I mentioned, you start calculating differently instead of yield per acre, nutrition per acre as we do, our data is showing we can feed two times India's population by not destroying a single aspect of life on earth. By conserving biodiversity, you actually grow more food. So, and we, you know, we do this, but we also do the measures. And part of my quantum theory training is what you measure is what you find. When you look for a wave, you'll find the wave. When you look for the particle, you'll find the particle. So none of the measures are independent of what you were looking for. If you're looking for a commodity, you'll create a yield by acre. When you're looking for health, you'll create health by acre. No, thank you very much. And I think as a world, we need to really focus on those supply chains and rethink the way that they are structured in order to uh, benefit the greater society and the world that we live in. So thank you very much for your time. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for that question, Bruno. Um, I'm torn as to which question to follow up um, with Dr. Shiva. I think this will be the last one. Um, but I think coming out of this, really keeping the focus on uh, the pandemic and kind of farming post pandemic, um, I'm curious, I feel like for myself at the beginning of um, when COVID first started, I was really concerned for um, a lot of my friends in my broader community of farmers of just the challenges that they would face um, during this. And then I really um, kind of turned that around and was almost maybe upset with myself that I didn't see it sooner of um, all of the learning that I've done, especially in the faculty of land and food systems with um, this is why we have local foods. Uh, this is why we have our local farmers is to be resilient in these uh, these large scale challenges. Um, and I was really just hoping that this would be the time for them. To find. And so I know for me, that's been a personal example of um, of a demonstration of why we have these food systems. And I'm curious, um, Dr. Shiva, if you could share, um, we've been in this for a few months now, and I'm wondering if you've actually observed tangible examples of, um, I mean, we're 
we talk about this all the time of having these alternative food systems makes us more resilient. Biodiversity equals resiliency. Um, and I'm wondering if you could give us an example just from your observations over the last few months of maybe somewhere where you've seen that. Well, I'll give you an example. One of the programs, you know, precisely because of the garden paradigm, when farmers started to commit suicide and school kids started to commit suicide, I said, let's start Gardens of Hope for children in schools and for widows of the suicide. I had a call, the peak of the epidemic, or, or of the pandemic. And uh, this peasant woman tells me, she says, thank you so much, Didi. Didi is elder sister in India. Uh, for inspiring us to grow gardens. We thought it was an extra. But during the lockdown, this is where our food came from. And um, the second thing that's happening is we saved seeds, you know, and our fruits might be a little smaller, but they're full of phytochemicals. And I talked about my mother's mangoes. We are now realizing that resilience is also immunity, you know, comes back to the idea of potential. The same body can have potential for sickness with lack of immunity. The same person can have resilience to infections with good immunity. People are now realizing it's not the size that matters. It's the quality and the nutrition and the phytochemicals, the diversity of nourishment that matters. So there's a whole revisit to nutritional density, amazing biodiversity of ingredients in a seed. The size, I think white superiority, just admired size. I think if you're looking, living through equality, anti-racism and decolonization, uh, we need to stop celebrating size and start celebrating the multiplicity of smallness. When I started saving seeds to deal with Monsanto patents, GMO, WTO, I took inspiration from Gandhi's spinning wheel. He had said, a spinning wheel will get us freedom. And we did get freedom. So I said, the seed will be the spinning wheel of today. So in this period, the inspiring stories just keep, I mean, people call me from Italy and say how the CSAs have exploded and was the only way they could get food because the supermarkets shelves emptied out. Right. Um, that's definitely, I agree, that's definitely been a silver lining here um, in BC as well, as a lot of the farmers um, just seeing exponential growth in, um, in their harvest box programs. Um, so it's great to hear that that's also happening in other countries too. Um, and also, uh, not that there's ever a good time for a pandemic, but uh, when you're um, when the grocery stores are having a hard time sourcing food, at least in BC, because we have such opposite uh, um, opposite seasons here for the pandemic to be happening in the summer and having local food here. It's really great the diversity of foods that we have. Um, and I guess in the in the winter, it'll be interesting to see um, what there will be available locally and what the farmers will be able to produce this summer. Um, so I think that we've run out of time for other questions um, and I will just pass uh, the mic over to Ricky again. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Amy. And thank you, Dr. Shiva. This became a wonderful conversation, which I hoped it would be. So thank you all. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Shiva for taking time out of her day, because I think Dr. Shiva is coming on to about 10.30 PM. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you for staying up late with us. I have to let the people know something about you. So um, we had a bit of a conversation prior to the webinar. And I'll tell you what a good student Dr. Shiva is, because we had sent her material and she went through it thoroughly. So Dr. Shiva, you're still a wonderful lifelong learner. So thank you for that. <laughs> and I also love the fact that you're a wonderful daughter. You listen to your mother. <laughs> um, and I'm glad that you still are because some of us, uh, I think we listen, but don't really listen. <laughs> to our parents. So thank you for being a wonderful daughter, listener, and, and taking some of those messages. I just want to let people know that um, a survey will be coming out from UBC Connects, and we would appreciate 
you filling that out. Uh, this has been a wonderful hour with Dr. Shiva and our students. And I, again, I want to thank our student questioners and Amy as the moderator. I think you guys did a wonderful job. And Dr. Shiva, thank you for answering those questions so thoroughly and with passion. So with that, I want to thank everyone who participated in today's webinar. And as I said in my opening remarks, I think there were close to 900 people, which is just phenomenal, uh, which is such a testament to Dr. Shiva's drawing power. So thank you, Dr. Shiva. So with that, I want to wish everyone a good day. And in Canada, it's a long weekend. So have a wonderful, safe, long weekend. And again, Dr. Shiva, our thanks to you. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. yeah, thank you.